It's important to be adding value to your dynasty portfolios right now. And Jaden Reed's one of those guys that when you look at what he was able to do in his rookie season, compared to guys like Jordan Addison, who Jordan Addison before the Kirk Cousins news, before uh, everything that's happened in Minnesota, was going mid-fifth in dynasty startup drafts. He's now slid to like the 5-6 turn, mid-6 maybe. But a guy that finished as the wide receiver 23 overall in his first season in the NFL. A guy that had 108 targets, 911 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Okay. Uh, Zay Flowers, another guy that was still going in the fifth, really. The wide receiver, 31 in his first year. 108 targets, so pretty much the same. 858 yards and five touchdowns. So less touchdowns, but also just less all-around efficient. And then you've got Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed was wide receiver, 25, so right behind Jordan Addison. uh, 94 targets, 793 yards, and eight touchdowns. And Jaden Reed has been consistently valued at the end of the sixth, early seventh. So right away, you see a value discrepancy. And honestly, I'm not sure why. Jaden Reed is a guy that was a pretty good prospect coming in, got good draft capital, went to a decent situation. We didn't really know how the situation would be because of Jordan Love, but now has gone and is playing with a quarterback that was really efficient last year. That's going to get paid on offense that's pretty decent. And he can be the wide receiver one on his team. In fact, I would say he is, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah, he absolutely is. He was last year when everyone was still hung up on Christian Watson. Oh, by the way, a lot of people still are. And everyone just says, oh, if he's healthy, he's, he's going to be, we play the if in the butt game with Christian Watson, just like we have with, you know, other guys like T Higgins and we, you know, overinflate their value. Watson, Granted, has lost a lot of value this year, but True. he was very valuable last season. And we said, why not just, you know, pivot off of Christian Watson and go get a pretty much just as unproven guy in, in Jaden Reed, who has second round draft capital. And it paid off. And the thing with Reed, I understand that the, one of the biggest arguments with Reed is, uh, or the one, of the one of the biggest arguments against Reed is that he was touchdown dependent. Right, kind of the same thing as Christian Watson his rookie year, where he had that historic stretch, a ton of touchdowns. Jaden Reed, outside of the games that he didn't score touchdowns, I mean, six, nine, ten, one, twelve, seven, nineteen. That's good. Five, twenty. That's good. Some bu- fifteen. So, some, some so, games. so a couple good so ones. I'm pretty sure those bigger games were later in the season, though, right? Yeah, they were later, which in is the a good time. That's what that you want to see. Time. Yeah. So like his last three games without a touchdown, fifteen points. Uh, 20 points, five points, and then 19 points. So those are the last four games that I touched down. Yeah. That's what you want to see. in those 15 and week 18. In, in those Chicago. games, he had six targets, eight targets, 10 targets, and four targets. So, like I mentioned, I think Jaden Reed, when you're talking about him being priced next to some of these guys that were producing at similar levels as rookies, uh, I think he's I think he's the best value out of all of them. Yeah, and I think that's the point here is, is it's really – not who do we think is the best talent. I think objectively Jordan Addison is by far the most talented wide receiver of this bunch. Jaden Reed, do we have questions about him? Sure, sure, sure we do. Do we think that they could eventually get another receiver? Maybe, I don't know. I think it's unlikely because they have a really good group of guys. I mean, even Dubs is pretty solid. Yeah. But at this point, it's the value. At this point, it's the price. And if we're being honest... Every single one of these wide receivers from a situational perspective has major question marks. Zay Flowers has question marks. He does. We don't really know if the Ravens believe that he's a true wide receiver one on their team. If they think that he can function as that in that offense, that, in my opinion, is not a super high ceiling with the current offense that they, that they run, that they operate, especially with Mark Andrews coming back healthy. That was a question going into Zay Flowers' rookie season, which why which was why he was so cheap, but now he's increased in value. Jordan Addison, we, we've already talked about it. Kirk Cousins is gone. We have no idea who's going to play quarterback for them next season. No idea. And I and I think it's probably not bold to say that that QB won't provide as much volume right out the gate as Kirk Cousins did for Addison's rookie season. So let's talk about Nico. Nico is a guy that last year, you know, obviously his first two years didn't do anything, but was in an abysmal situation. Wide receiver 86 and 77 in PPR leagues his first two years. But then moving to his third year, finally got a quarterback, played the most games of his career. He was the wide receiver 12, so he's a wide receiver one in Dynasty Leagues. 110 targets, eight touchdowns, 1,300 yards, 261 PPR points. Is Nico a buy in Dynasty Fantasy Football? I don't think so. Why? Because why would I pay a premium 
for a guy that is going into the fourth year of his rookie contract. It is completely unknown whether Houston is actually going to pay the contract that he demands going into year five when I can get Tank Dell at a discount at a cheaper price when he, in my opinion, has just as good a chance of being the fantasy wide receiver one as Nico Collins does. I think the Tank Dell argument's good, but I'm not sure about the contract. I'm almost positive Houston pays him. Like, because okay. because when you're looking at what he was able to do in the first two years of his career, like, again, that situation was so bad. Last year, he was... He had 1,300 receiving yards. Mm-hmm. Like, he was good. Yeah. So I think that that reason alone... I, I think Nico's... Odds are he's going to be productive again this year, right? Because Houston, he's probably going to be the wide receiver 1A or 1B, whatever you want to call it, in Houston. And so he's probably going to produce again under a second-year C.J. Stroud. And then Houston... I don't think it would be a bad move to pay Nico Collins, but even if Houston doesn't pay Nico Collins, I feel like some team will. And Nico Collins clearly showed what he was capable of. I mean, Nico Collins... I mean, when you're talking about his value and what his actual price is in dynasty leagues right now, you're talking about equivalent to about the 107. Jonathan Taylor, are you taking Brandon Ayuk or Nico? Um, I'm taking Ayuk. Uh, two attack of Iloa is down there, and so that's kind of the price range he's going right now. Nico Collins is not is admittedly not somebody I've drafted a lot of, but when you're looking at Nico in his last year, especially like some of what he was able to do from an efficiency standpoint, like I mentioned, he was eighth in receiving yards. He was sixth in yak, which you saw a ton of that on tape with him just getting these bombs from CJ Stroud. That was a lot of it. 11th touchdown, seventh in fantasy points per game. He was second in the league last year in yards per route run. One of the most important metrics in identifying Good fantasy assets, productive fantasy wide receivers, and Nico Collins was second in that category last year. He was also second in formation adjusted yards per out run. He was third in yards per target, 11.9 yards per target, which is that is a lot. Again, you saw a lot of the deep balls. You do have to ask yourself, will teams start taking that away? I don't think Nico would be a hard buy for me. Because again, I do like Tank Dell better at price, and there's always, there's always somebody better at price. I don't think that makes somebody a buy. But that being said, Nico Collins, somebody that people have advocated for us to talk about. Alvin Kamara is also going to be on this list, and you were doing some deep diving on Alvin Kamara today, and you noticed some players that were actually more valuable than Alvin Kamara that kind of made us you know, a little bit interested to talk about it. Yeah, so I was doing a team blueprint today for a team that's really locked into contending for the next couple of years because they gave up all their rookie draft picks. So I was kind of giving them some feedback for the next couple of years. Hey, here's some guys that you should target, some one-year rentals that are really good prices. Let's move off, you know, one of these running backs that just isn't as productive, and let's get a guy like Alvin Kamara because of who he's value equivalent to. Oh, and by the way, if you do want a dynasty blueprint or a team blueprint, uh, you can go over to flockfantasy.com slash domain, use code domain, sign up for the mother flocker tier using code domain, and you get one of our customizable team blueprints where you give where I give you, we give you all of that roster feedback for you and your team for the next three seasons, some players that you should be buying, some players that you should be selling, some customizable feedback on that team and you get all of our exclusive too. You get our exclusive videos, databases, articles, and our Discord. You get to slide into our DMs and ask us questions, follow up questions about the blueprints that we gave to you, all that type of stuff. But really, if we are looking at Alvin Kamara specifically, some of the people that he's value equivalent to. This is gonna be this is very, very funny. I discovered that Ramondre Stevenson Tony Pollard and Brian Robinson and Ty J Spears are all more valuable right now than Alvin Kamara. How many how many targets did Alvin Kamara have last year, Nathan? Don't no, just guess. Uh, oh. He missed four games or three games? Three games. Three or three games. Um yeah. I want to say he had like 80. 87. 87 targets. 87, guys. Second in the league in targets. He was ninth in red zone touches at 46. But you're talking about, you know. We talk about the, the age cliff with running backs. And so in Dynasty, you're always trying to get out a year early, blah, blah, blah. Well, everybody's been getting out a year early for three years now in Alvin Kamara. And that's why his value really is comparatively in the toilet. For a guy that you're talking about was fourth in yards per outrun, was fifth in catch rate, was seventh in yard, or route participation, second in target share. Mm-hmm. And not efficient on the ground. 45th in true yards per carry, 37th in yard per touch. But it doesn't matter how efficient he is in the ground because of what he's being used as. And the other part of that is, and subsequently, he is being used as that receiving back. He is going to last longer in the league. He's 28 and a half as we record this video, I think. Yeah, 28 and a half. And yeah, a lot of people are going to be looking at 29 and they're going to be like, yeah, 29 year old, 30 year old running backs. You want to get them off your roster, blah, blah, blah. Got to get out on the value. Guys, yeah. let him die on your roster. Yeah. And I mean, talk about contract. People are going to say, well, we don't even know like what he's going to do after this year. Actually, we kind of do. Uh, the Saints had an out this year 
and uh, they they didn't take it. He's going to be on the Saints in 2024, as long as nothing insane happens, which I don't think it can at this point. Um, and then in 2025, he's owed a ton of money on the back end in 2025. If they cut him, they're not really going to save any money. I, I think he's stuck with the Saints for at least... I think he's stuck with the Saints through 2025. Um, so that's kind of funny because that's just classic New Orleans Saints. They, they just Cat kick the can down the road yeah. and they're stuck with super old players that are a shell of what they used to be. But, I mean, contract aside, isn't, isn't production cool? Aren't points cool? Don't points win you your leagues? Don't points win you money? Isn't money is cool? It is cool. T-shirt. It is cool. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And, look, uh, like the other guys that he's value equivalent to – do they not have questions? Ramondre Stevenson. New coaching staff. He didn't do anything last year. Ramondre, Antonio like Gibson. What? Like, Antonio Gibson actually will eat into his workload. Like you're Tony talking about- Pollard. Yeah, he got paid. <sighs> yeah, I think Pollard's an okay value. But Ty J. Spears is still there. We don't really... And he's not a bell cow running back. Brian Robinson. <laughs> T- Tony Pollard is like... He's what... He, he's like you, you wishing that he could be what Kamara actually has been true and continues to be. 18 fantasy and, points per game this year he was third in fantasy yeah. points per game like guys when you're talking about on the ground as a running back 32nd in rushing yards right 32nd 24th in total touchdowns 24th in the league and being third in points per game you know what they call that sustainable yeah especially for an old running yeah. back and again it's very, <laughs> it's very like aaron jones-esque guys and, and people i think are afraid of the dalvin cook effect i'd say Pump the brakes on that and think about the Aaron Jones effect. Because Aaron Jones and Alvin Kamara, no, they're not fully comparable, but the the type of running back, the, 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 the type of skill set that they offer to the team that they're on is very similar. They're not that bell cow running back. They're not there every single down. They are that receiving option, and they get a lot of work in the red zone as well. So, and... and Kamara is historically, he's more durable than, than Aaron Jones is, and Aaron Jones is still holding quite a bit of value. Yeah. Jordan Love, especially for Superlex peeps, Jordan Love's going to be a good value because he's going at the 2-3 turn in Superflex drafts right now in startups. And Jeez. he's a guy that could go 1-2 so turn, especially after he gets paid this year. I mean, it's really not a secret that Jordan Love's going to get a contract this year, this offseason. Yeah. He was really good last year. They gave him the volume to perform as a, a high-performing fantasy asset. Uh, he was fifth in fantasy points per game. He averaged 19.5 points per game. He was fifth in pass attempts, third in deep ball attempts, second in red zone attempts. And this is a guy that... Seventh in passing yards in the league. He's second in air yards, right? And all the while, not being the most efficient passer, but being a rookie. He was essentially was, a rookie. I was going to say, a lot of that was skewed by the first half of the season when he was, guess what, playing like a rookie. Because sitting on the bench for three years doesn't mean that you're you're a veteran like a lot of people expected. Um, <laughs> he ended up getting a lot better, though. So when you're looking at... You know, his efficiency, you might say, yeah, that's nothing to write home about. But also, like, the fact that he had four rushing touchdowns last year. It's 28 extra points on his season, mm-hmm. which is fairly significant when you're talking about adding points from a quarterback perspective. Per game. Like, that's a couple more points per game. That's what we like to see. One and a half points per game just from rushing touchdowns. Not a ton of rushing yards per game. He averaged, like, he, he on average, added 1.5 points per game uh, on the ground. But again, between that and the touchdowns, you're talking about two extra points per game. Like you're talking about the difference between him and Trevor Lawrence, who they're going in the same spot right now, but you can get Jordan Love for Trevor Lawrence right now. I personally, and this might be a hot take, I prefer Jordan Love over Trevor Lawrence. And for me, I don't really even have to think about it. Um, That might be like super aggressive, but I don't really care at, at this point because Jordan Love to me, had a, had a way more impressive first season than Trevor Lawrence has, has put together over the last three seasons. And, and with Lawrence, yeah, he's always going to have that uh, 101 label. He'll, he'll be around in the league for a long time. He will. Is Jordan Love not? Especially when we know he's going to get paid, and we know how the Packers organization is run. Like, there, there's a big part of this being, like, the, the fact that Jordan Love is on the Packers. And we know how the Packers run their franchise. They've done it for the last two decades, Favre, Rodgers, they got something in love. They're going to keep love for a really long time. Trevor Lawrence, I don't honestly, it is not a guarantee that Jacksonville has an amazing year this year. And if that's the case, Trevor Lawrence's future is in limbo. I also don't trust Doug Peterson. Never really have. Didn't like the hire to begin with. They had a very good year because anything is better than Urban Meyer. 
Lawrence had an underwhelming year. Yes, he was banged up. Yes, he struggled with injury. Does Lawrence athletically and capability-wise have, have a higher ceiling than Jordan Love? Maybe. That's debatable. You might be right if, if you think that's the case. But for me, I'm taking the safer situation with, with a head coach that I think really solidified himself as a long-term answer for the Packers organization. Like, LaFleur should have been a candidate for coach of the year. Easily. And he wasn't. It's crazy. But that's just kind of where I'm at with Love. I, I don't know if you're as adamant about that as I am, but I prefer Love I, no, over I actually I, I agree with you, actually. I, I would take him, too. So talk about yeah. Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, JT is a guy that we kind of, you know, we mentioned here and there just because we're, you know, we're Colts fans. But we're we, we've kind of shied away from talking about him too much because we don't want to get too annoying. But uh, his price has gotten too annoying <laughs> for us um, in, in a positive way because, you know, the cheaper a guy is, uh, the closer and closer he becomes to being a buy. And JT is like so far beyond that point that he's like a smashing buy. Uh, he's falling to the mid fourth consistently as the running back five overall in dynasty fantasy football with a brand new three year contract. That's right. Last year did not count as the first year of his three year contract that starts in 2024. He was still riding out his fourth year on his rookie contract this past season. You have three years, two guaranteed for sure, because I think they do have an out for the third year. That's just standard for running backs. Yes. You have two to three more years, and I, I, I would guess, you know, probably three, because it's Jonathan Taylor, um, th- of JT production on the Indianapolis Colts with Anthony Richardson. I'm, I mean, on an offense last year that really wasn't that good, he averaged 15 and a half points per game. In and, and, and out of in and out of like finicky injuries, too, like a thumb where he, where he missed a couple games. And, and obviously like the that. contract stuff. Right. So... When you're talking about Jonathan Taylor, you're talking about running back strategy and dynasty. Like we're the ones that have been very vocal about like you should probably sell most of your running backs and then buy the running backs back you want after the season. But when you're talking about a Jonathan Taylor, a guy who has 18 point per game upside still, he does. He does have that upside. At least. And you're talking about getting him in the fourth round. Like there really isn't anybody in the fourth round. You're talking about backs like Kyron Williams, guys like Devon Achan going in the fourth round. Those guys really don't have the consistent ceiling that Jonathan Taylor does. Yeah, we saw a productive year from Kyron Williams last year, but a lot of people are going to say that's going to be unsustainable because they're probably going to bring somebody in to compete with Kyron Williams, which is absolutely true. Yeah, this is this is case in point why I don't think Nico Collins is a buy. If Nico Collins and Jonathan Taylor are value equivalent, I am smashing Jonathan Taylor all day. You're talking about giving me a top five running back in Dynasty Fantasy Football versus the wide receiver 17, 18, Easily give me JT. I give me JT. I, 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 yeah, that's a whole other discussion. But you know, no, it's not. Yeah, I mean, it kind of is. I, I don't. I don't think that I would easily take JT over Nico Collins in Dynasty at this point because you got to talk about Nico Collins, a guy that for first year had a quarterback was a top twelve wide receiver. I mean, running backs in general are uh, we we more, already are more we already scarce. know that positionally wide receiver is more valuable, right. and that's why we say hey, as a rebuild, invest in wide receiver. But with Jonathan Taylor as a top five running back. That you're getting, that's not common. That that's a very new thing that has happened really this True. year because of how bad last season was for running for the running back landscape as a whole. I'm more comfortable with Jonathan Taylor if that if I like because I mean we we already know that we're supposed to because of the vol- volatility of the running back position we're supposed to view their windows in two to three year windows. We have that window with, with we do. JT, and so like what it, I was what I was getting at was. You the talk about the guys going in the fourth round with Jonathan Taylor. Travis Etienne's going after Jonathan Taylor. When you're getting a running back like Jonathan Taylor, who has running back one upside, he still he still does he still does guys. He he especially with Anthony Richardson, Jonathan Taylor. If he plays a full year this year, could light it up behind a good offensive line and a Shane Steichen offense. He could light it up. If Miles Sanders can perform in a Shane Steichen offense, so can Jonathan Taylor, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. talking about Jonathan Taylor, this is a guy when you're talking about running back strategy and dynasty that I would draft in the fourth round and get four or five years of production out of him while he until he's not irrelevant anymore. And that would be worth my fourth round pick. So I would let him die on my roster. Again, I, I don't we, even we have spend to, so I don't much. I don't even think you have to talk about him dying on your roster at this point in time. He's 25 years old. And in a guy going at price with this contract, he can absolutely maintain his value going into 2025. Easily, easily. I mean, he averages 16 points per game and he's maintaining this. He really is. Yes. Over a full season, 
Absolutely. So Jonathan Taylor is a guy that right now I feel like he's far and away the best running back at price when you're talking about like he's he is pretty much a cornerstone asset still. Like he technically doesn't qualify in our rankings, but he's pretty much a cornerstone. Uh, George Kittle is going to be next. George Kittle is a guy you're getting like ninth round right now. You're talking about the first team all pro George Kittle. It's like, yes, fantasy is different than the real NFL we know. But, you know, let's talk about fantasy. All right. Second in in total touchdowns this year. First in receiving yards. He had a thousand receiving yards this year. 10th in receptions, 3rd in yak, 4th in unrealized air yards. So you're talking about on top of everything that he was able to do from a fantasy perspective this year, 4th in unrealized air yards. Talking about a Brock Purdy that, you know, could get better year over year. He was the tight end 5 this year. He's only 30 years old. He's in the prime of his career. He is 1st in yards per target. He's 1st in yards per reception. He's 1st in yards per team pass attempts. He's 1st in yards per route run. So he's one of the most efficient tight ends in the entire league. And you're talking about the opportunity share, 7th in target share, 10th in targets, 14th in target rate. So you're talking about performing at a number one level efficiency on seven to 10 level opportunity and getting some touchdowns, but also getting a thousand receiving yards for as good of a blocking tight end as he is. It's insane. It's how much receiving production you're talking about a 49ers offense where Brandon Ayuk might not be there. We don't know what's going to happen with Ayuk. Yeah, that's up in the air, but the up in the airness, George Kittle's a good value anyways, regardless of that. But then if you see Ayuk move away, you could see an uptick in his usage again. And talk about George Kittle. Like, what if he gets up to top five in, in opportunity again? And he's capable of that. In tight end premium leagues, George Kittle, in my opinion, is the best tight end price. Yeah, this year was case in point why uh, you don't say, uh, well, this guy's injury prone. You don't account for injury in the value of a player as long as they're not uh, Darren Waller when they get hurt literally every other game because of their hamstring. But George Kittle, I understand he gets banged up here and there. It happens. It's the type of tight end that he is. But when you know what his production capability is and you know that he's going at a severe discount because of the so-called concerns of him missing two or three games in a year, it's absolutely worth the risk at the price. And it paid off this year because... Well, he didn't really. And miss so any, I don't even. I don't even time. buy the injury. Like, yeah, you can you can play through when you're hurt. Injured is different. For, in the last three years, 14, 15, and sixteen games played. 95, 86, and ninety targets. Fourth, second, and sixth in fantasy points per game. That's consistency to me, guys. You're talking about somebody who's consistently performing as a yep. top five points per game tight end. Consistently getting around ninety targets. I mean, you're talking about ninety five, eighty six, and ninety. You're talking about ninety point one five is the average there. That's it's it's consistency. And this year he played sixteen games. And you're getting him in the ninth round. Like, I'm good passing on tight ends early in the draft if you can get George Kittle that late in Dynasty Startup drafts right now. Last guy on this list. Yeah, Curtis Samuel. He's just kind of an, (laughs) my gosh, I can't talk, an intriguing guy. Um, going way, way down your boards. He he just ended up having a really nice landing spot in free agency. He goes, he signs with the Buffalo Bills. Gabe Davis is out. Curtis Samuel is in. They're not the same type of wide receiver. They don't play the same role. But Curtis Samuel is a really nice gadget guy who could provide some very solid value for the Buffalo Bills as an NFL team, an NFL offense, and could really help Curtis Samuel's production. I mean, he's consistently been a wide receiver three, productive type of wide receiver, like, receiver from a fantasy perspective but that has resulted in some very big games he's very boom bust because of the way that he's utilized in the red zone he gets a lot of those touchdowns sometimes and i'm very intrigued to see how they could utilize him in buffalo's offense it's a way I mean, better situation than washington and he was productive there over the last couple of Curtis years Samuel, even last year was a good guy to flex in your bye weeks for sure with washington and with washington yeah. not playing with josh allen playing with sam howell and you can trade right now keaton mitchell for Curtis Samuel. yeah why not why not? Of course you're taking Curtis Samuel. Take a piece of the Bills offense. Take somebody who is a dynamic playmaker who was able to show out in a bad offense, now go into a better situation playing with a better quarterback on a team that really does need that kind of weapon. Yeah, Curtis Samuel is a good sneaky buy low. So like Nathan mentioned, if you want us to help you with your roster, if you want us to break down your roster, have a one-on-one consulting experience after that, flockfantasy.com slash domain. Use code domain. Make sure you guys drop a like on the video and make sure you subscribe to the channel. Appreciate you guys watching today. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you later.